three key areas. Uh, we have the donor partner, we also have a private sector player, and we have a public sector player who I know so well for so many years. And I can assure you that we are going to have a wonderful time. And so the panelists today are Mrs. Uh, Dorothy Amuasante. Uh, she is um, an energy, a senior energy specialist at the USAID. Uh, before working with the USAID, she had actually worked for so many years with the Energy Commission of Ghana, uh, specifically the Renewable Energy Unit. And so she is the donor partner. So coming with two hats, one had been, you know, someone who has already worked with the public sector, but currently she has the status as someone working with the donor agency. We also have Mr. Safiano Nasamu. She is, uh, he is a, a practice, uh, sorry, a private sector player. Uh, Mr. Sofiano Nasamu is the chief executive officer of uh, the Nyankonton Solar Energy uh, Products Limited. Uh, this is located in Kumase. Uh, although based in Germany, there is a leading organization here that is actually uh, sort of uh, fronting all activities on his behalf. Then we have Dr. Joseph Esando. Uh, he is coming with the public sector you know, background. Dr. Joseph Esando has worked within the energy sector for you know, uh, more than three decades, I think starting from uh, 1989, from 2003 to uh, 2019. He was the head of the strategic planning and policy division at the Energy Commission. He co-led the national, uh, what is it, uh, the, the development of the strategic national energy plan uh, for Ghana, uh, starting which was for 20, 2006 to 2020. He has been a member of the government of Ghana's negotiating team to the UN Climate Change Convention. Um, and the Kyoto Protocol. And he's also a lead author for the IPPC, uh, the IPCC Working Group 3 Assessment Report. So ladies and gentlemen, these are our three panelists. This is how we are going to go by our discussion. I don't want it to be just questions and answers, but rather it's going to be interactive a bit of a dialogue, as I'll put it. What I'll need to stress is that uh, if you have questions in the course of uh, their responses, I will be happy to actually receive them through, um, what is it, the chat box, and I can raise them. But in the meantime, we want to actually look at three questions that they will give their expert views, looking at where they sit, or where they operate from. The first question, and I'll tie it to the second one, which I will give each one of them five minutes to respond to, uh, is for them to give us a perspective of what the continental agenda is on renewable energy, narrowing it down to Ghana, especially. So where are we with the renewable energy agenda? Continentally? and look, speaking from the perspective of for Ghana as a country. Then what are the challenges that are hampering the progress of the implementation of such an agenda? And this, I we also want to hear from them based on their different expertise or their different backgrounds. And so to kickstart, I will invite Mrs. Dorothy Amuasante to actually give us her submission on where are we in terms of the continental agenda on uh, renewable energy, in Ghana in particular, and what have been some of the successes but the challenges as well. So Mrs. Dorothy Amuasante, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Dorothy. Dorothy, can you come in? Yes, in fact, we can hear you, Dorothy. Um, so while Dorothy is fixing her uh, system, can we hear from uh, Mr. Safiano Nasamo? Yeah, hello. Good morning, hello. everyone. Thank Good morning. you for having me here today. I really appreciate that. Um, so let me jump direct uh, to the topic. Uh, you've already mentioned uh, where I come from. Uh, Nyankunton Solar Energy is a registered company in Ghana. So we work, uh, we are well known and registered in the Energy Commission. So we are based in Kumasi. So let's uh, just see the first question you asked was, uh, uh, where are we with the renewable energy agenda today in Ghana? Uh, this is a very interesting topic. Uh, this question are uh, really relevant and worth considering as far as the renewable energy development agenda in Ghana is concerned. As we all know, the Republic of Ghana aims to develop uh, its utilization of renewable energy and energy efficiency technology to achieve 10% penetration of the national electricity production by 2020. So, um, Mr. Estando, if I'm wrong, you correct me. For my information, what I know is until now, we have not even achieved 1%. <clears throat> so, uh, this is a very big question that we need to ask ourselves. Are we, do we really want to do it? What are we doing? You know, so, uh, so the situation now uh, shows us that we started very good at the early stage like uh, uh, giving some free panels to the to the to, to the anybody who want to install a solar whatever there is a lot of programs but none of them really uh, worked very well and the enforcement was also very weak my opinion i'm very happy i said again <laughs> said to mr sanders here so i can get my 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 point right uh, corrected if wrong so this is the this is the whole issue we know you know if you have a target we need to know what we are doing but if i have a target to achieve 10 percent and in all these years i'm not even able to get one percent then this is a very big question mark there you know and uh, it seems like we are even going backwards so this is my opinion i think i'm not going to use the five minutes completely because this topic is very uh I just summarize it to this point, and uh, I think uh, this is where I will remain and say that uh, my I know that we have not achieved it. The agenda is didn't work. So, what is the, our plan for the future to 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 get a new agenda, or where are we heading towards? To? Thank you, Mr. Safiano Nasamo, um, for your submission. Um, Dorothy, have you been able to sort out your mic? Hello, Dorothy. Okay. Right, I think we... Right, I think we still have problem with Dorothy's mic. Uh, apologies for that. Um, I think it gives an opportunity for me to move straight to Dr. Uh, Esando. Uh, if he can come in, <laughs> if you can come in with your submission. Um, okay. Good. Thank you very much. Do you hear my voice? Yes, we can hear you. We can see you. Yes. Oh, <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, uh, 
Sifiano, yeah, to some extent you are right. We are just around one, almost two percent at, at the end of this year in terms of electricity, because in terms of energy penetration, we never computed that. So the ten percent is for electricity penetration. Well, then the thing is, what do you want the electricity to do? What do you want it for? And the key thing is, that, is it affordable? So if you look at the continent, the whole across the continent, the average is around 45%. West Africa is between 30 to 50%. And then if you take away South Africa and then Ghana, then so Ghana, we're talking about uh, this year, want to hit 86%. South Africa, you know, they are around uh, uh, 92 or something like that, right? So now if you want to have that universal penetration, what do you do? When you are going to buy Coca-Cola from the store, you don't ask what electricity, what energy was was used to produce it. All what you are interested in is the price. The things to wear the item is the price. So the key thing is affordability. Now, like the previous uh, presentation made by Buama, the coal. Now, if the coal is what you have, and then it's the most, I would say, the cheapest to produce. And then you don't have the issue with carbon dioxide emissions. So now the challenge is, how do you do? How do you mitigate it? And I keep saying, there's a key thing. If you put the whole thing in a, I would say, in, in, in a menu, now you have this issue. How do you mitigate the CO2, the greenhouse gas emission, and take advantage of the, I would say, the, the, the affordability of it? And that's what I think most of African countries we are failing to do. So like he mentioned, you don't just excuse me to say the uh, the north uh, the northern part or the parties of the north putting pressure on us. You look at yourself, your condition. And a good example you mentioned South Africa. A good another example India. When India put the same World Bank to sponsor a coal power project, they put all the challenges. They had to mitigate all that. But most of the African countries, I remember Senegal put this. They didn't do that. You cannot just say you are producing coal. No, now how do you handle the emissions? And I remember when VRA and Sonia Asoglu was talking about it, they say, hey, then let's handle the CO2 emission. And then, okay, so we have what? What is the CO2? Afforestation, then let's embark on all these afforestation to minimize the whole thing. Because there's nothing like 100% clean. You're always going to have challenges with whatever technology you have. Renewables include renewables. Because now we're talking about some countries are talking about 100% renewables, particularly solar and all the education by uh, 2050 and others. Now I keep saying, hey, you're talking about the, what about the batteries, the lithium, the cobalt, they're going to use to produce the batteries. Are you talking about, have you think of, are we planning for also the recycling aspect? And do look at what is happening. Even, you know, Congo is one of the largest producers. And look, I go there and see what is happening over there. We see there everything have negative. Now, how, how do you mitigate the negative aspect? That's what we have to discover. Now, when it comes to Africa, when it comes to when it uh, talks about the uh, the fossil fuels, it's going to be with us for some time. The bio uh, the biomass. Hey, Ghana here, I believe by 2020, 30, we're still going to have significant biomass penetration. Now we're talking about, uh, let me see my figures. So we are sorry that I'm not making a uh, PowerPoint presentation That's for the, because of the discussion. We're talking about around uh, 46 kind of men. By 2020, we may hit around, say, uh, around 30%. If we are able to increase other clean energy sources like LPG, which otherwise, uh, let's forget it. But now look at the price of LPG compared to that of uh, I would say a ton, a, a ton of uh, LPG compared to a ton of uh, charcoal. About six times. You see, why then I'm in a village or using um, biomass or charcoal wood for to prepare my banku and I said to go and use um, uh, LPG every time it's a clean, a, a, because it's a clean fuel. He will tell, hey, go to my village, come to my village. My mother is uh, 91 years. My grandmother is still there. What about you in the city? Your parents are there in their, in their 70s. So don't talk about the poisoning. You see, I wish the university have done kind of research, uh, something to uh, check on some of these kind of things. 
So you see, they also look at the risk and then affordability. This is very, very, because still, the rural uh, folks are still, a lot of them are still afraid of the LPG. Not even the rural can even even come to Accra, the uh, per urban areas. They are still using uh, charcoal analysis. Uh, beside the, because it's very ch the cheapest, they also consider the risk aspect because, because of their time, the uh, social surroundings, the compound uh, uh, household system that we have. So that aspect is there. So, but then you're also going to see, uh, I would say the fossil fuels, oil and gas increasing still. Gas will really play a major share, sorry, a major, a major share in terms of electricity production. For oil, we're still going to have it. Even though we see a hot, what you call increase, increased production or use of um, electric vehicles in the, in the north, I would say, by our northern neighbors. But mind you, they are bringing or pushing down the old uh, turbine, I would say, automobile vehicles down here, and our governments are happy. You see, so mind you, they expected to use it those uh, for, for some time. And also, I keep telling our colleagues that under the Paris Agreement, they are not saying by force we should go at the same rate as the developed parties. Look at articles two, uh, two and four under the Paris Agreement. You see, Take your time, trans transition, but take your time. Make sure not at, at the detriment, at, sorry, at the detriment of your economy. And I think these are the very important issues that you have to consider. So you're still going to have significant penetration of gas, significant penetration of uh, biofuels, and because we need to increase our LC penetration. So I end here because of time. Believe me, I take all your time. So sorry. Thank you very much. Yes. Thanks so much for your submission. Yes, Dorothy, can we hear from you, if you are okay? Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, I think I can hear you. Okay, um, thank you very much, and apologies for the mishap that just happened. I think it's technology issues, so. <laughs> oh, sure. um, so I just want to touch lightly um, on the first question that looks at um, the development of um, areas in our country. I mean, looking at the two facets of it in terms of policy and practice. I would say with respect to Ghana in policy or in, in the creation of the enabling environment, we have done some substantial work, but in practice, we have a long way to go as um, the two speakers uh, narrated, Mr. Safianu and Mr. Dr. Sandor. Um, there's, a there's a lot to, to do in that space. Um, in that, um, I can say the background work to ignite the development of RE has already started. The few nitty gritties that need to be put in place to create the attractive environment for private sector is there. However, there is still the need to tighten those bolts and nuts um, to make it conducive and, a, and create a right business environment for the private sector to have a sustainable business model running here. And that's the component that is lacking and that's the component that is not coming um, effectively or loudly from the government space. So I would say that the big challenge or the huge obstacle to the advancement of this has been from the public side in, 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 in light of commitment, if I can just lump it up as that. Commitment in the sense of um, having the regulations and implementing it as a test. As Mr. Safiano indicated, we've had the net metering um, regulation coming out. We've had issues with it going back and forth on that. Um, we, we've tried um, some models to, to reach out to the less privileged, to the rural areas with um, renewable energy technologies to help meet basic needs. We've, we've thought of um, bright ideas and bright modes of operation to get renewable energy advanced, but this has not really materialized because I think a lot of it has been the paperwork, a lot of it has been sitting on the shelves, and the practicality of it has not been realized and materialized just because the commitment on the side of government or the commitment of the side or on the side of, um, of the policymakers 
to own um, these policies, to own these regulations and run with it and implement it has not been realized. Let me just um, leave it there. I've already lost enough time with my technical issues, so I'll pick up with any subsequent questions that may come up. Thank you. Great. Thanks, thanks for the fascinating submissions from uh, the three of you. Um, I'm not sure if participants have got uh, questions that you would like me to raise. Um, you know, this segment is actually for 30 minutes, and I know we are just left with five minutes. Um, and so if you have any burning question, please just go to the, you know, the chat box and then uh, and raise it and I will throw it to them. Otherwise, um, yeah, I'm, I'm likely to go back to, great. I think there is a question here from uh, one of the panelists, uh, Johnny says, the Global North is beginning to promote a digital electrified peer-to-peer -peer paradigm, okay, at home. Um, in what ways do you see Ghana anticipating this development. So Global North is promoting the issue of peer-to-peer. -peer. In what way do we actually see Ghana anticipating the development issues in the frame of uh, pushing for our household, especially issue on storage, flexible grid? Uh, what, what any one of you can come in and uh, yeah. Safiano? Okay. Yeah, um, okay. Well, maybe. Yes. Sandor, come in, please. Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Well, when we talk about digitalization, then we're talking about, how you say, IT, the, um, uh, I would say, application. Well, we cannot run away from it. Uh, now, the COVID has changed the world. It has brought in this um, digitalization in almost every aspect of our life, like what we are doing now. It's going to grow. Because to some extent, I remember the other countries that see it as a way of also making a lot of savings. So it's going to reduce the share, it's likely to reduce the share of transportation uh, in terms of energy use on the continent, but not still not very significant. Yeah. You're going to have, um, like I'm saying, electric vehicles, but you don't expect that to be a, as the best significant share for the next 10 years, that's up to 2030. So it's going to be there. Uh, yes, but how significant that's uh, the question is, because still we like to use. Uh, there are some of other advantages when we have, uh, and then also when it comes to power, it's also very important because that's also help. But it would like what's happening now, so it means the digitization of our uh, which this city has already started, even policing our grades and all those things. Like I say, all these things are going to grow. Thank you very much. Great. Others are open for others to continue. So uh, I will also like to add something there. I think in this case, it's clear. Ghana or everywhere in the world, we are getting global. We are expecting any good thing. And uh, everything that comes in that will help is good. This let me go back to Mr. Essendus, uh, uh, what Mr. Essendus said about uh, renewable energy and solar. I think that we concentrated too much on cost we don't only deal with the cost. Cost is not our problem, not only our problem. The affordability is not only our problem. There are human beings behind the issue. They, they need to be addressed. If the people in, in the cities, they can buy whatever they like. They can do whatever they like, but there are still some people behind the issue who don't know what to do. And this is what makes the development world development because they care for their people. It doesn't matter where they are, not thinking about the money, the cost and everything. So if something is coming in Ghana, whatever from where is welcome, but we need to take a good look at it and see what is the benefit of it? How is it helping these people that are receiving it? Is it really a help or it is going to depress them and kill them instead? And this is what is going on. And this is what we are living day after day. The poor masses are suffering in the name of help. So this is, I think, what we need to think about. And for the country, we also need to think about not only money, not only cost. Cost is not the only issue. There are people behind the, uh, the scene. Thank you. Thank you, Safiano. Uh, 
Dorothy, do you have? Yeah. So, um, just to touch on the question about um, what Ghana is doing in the light of um, the paradigm of digitization and electrification. Um, as as mentioned earlier, we we have we have started and we have tried a couple of things. But I believe Ghana, Ghana tries to move along the trend or tries to move with what the flow is um, and what, what pertains out there in, in the sense that um, PVs are far advanced in terms of looking at all the renewable technologies. PVs are far advanced in our country. We are looking at storage or we are thinking storage already and flexible grids at the moment. We are also thinking electrical vehicles already as well. I say this in connection to um, discussions we've had with some of the state enterprises in the sector with respect to the work we do with them and what their needs and supports are going forward. Um, I think the Energy Commission has started or is trying to do something in the area of electrical vehicles. The flexible grids are being sort of by Gridco and ECG as well. Storage is also being looked at by Gridco and ECG, and we actually have some support to them through the National Renewable Energy Laboratory from the US. So um, maybe the world is moving faster than us, but um, <laughs> we, are, we are behind catching up maybe at a slower pace than expected. But that is because we have not allowed, I think my opinion is because we have not allowed our market to mature to that point where we can be a power with the developed world in terms of renewable energy technologies. But to touch on Mr. Safiano's point, um, Yes, it goes beyond costs and it goes beyond the money issue. There are people behind it. I think it's high time the government sits to think and look at the benefits these um, technologies bring to the people, the rural poor specifically, and also looking at those in the off-grid areas where we know the grid is not going to get there and they can thrive on things like the mini grades and the micro grades. What are we doing to support them? We can't always go with the lens of looking at certain parts of them at the same level that we get in the city just because um, maybe we are in the city, we are paying less, and they are in the rural areas or they are in upgrade areas. They have to pay more because their infrastructure has to be technically detached from the existing grid and it's going to cost money. But what is the input to their lives in terms of development? How is it adding value to them? Is it because we are thinking or assuming they can't afford? Um, a lot of thinking has to go into this and not just look at the aspects of price and cost, like Sofiane said, um, from, the, from the notion of the, the city dwellers or from the notion of the governmental seats, but pick each area in perspective and analyze it specifically with the conditions there and see the value that is coming to the people in general. Thank you. Um, yes. So I know our next session has to start at uh, 11.45. Uh, we would like to actually have maybe some five minutes break. So what I'll do is that I think I'll borrow part of the break time. Um, so we will have just the next five minutes and uh, I'll give one, uh, opportunity to a lady to actually ask the uh, his or her question. Uh, let it be snappy and let me hear from the, the, the panelists. Thank you very much, Simon. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning in Ghana, I'm not sure. Um, so uh, my name is Joyce. I'm a PhD candidate at TU Darmstadt. Um, I was actually part of the um, seminar last year, the workshop that took place last year. So I'm, I'm happy to be here again to join you for these discussions. Um, this morning, I, I'm kind of um, taking by the fact that the discussions revolve around these large scale um, centralized grid systems and um, ensuring access to, to electricity through these um, large scale systems. But we have also seen um, from the presentations yesterday, there were a lot of discussions about off grid systems. Paul made a very fascinating presentation about um, these individual installations, solar installations that people are um, acquiring on their own. To, to produce their own electricity and use them at home. Um, and Nora also mentioned uh, 
in passing about the issue of heterogeneous um, energy systems, one that is um, a new perspective in, in energy discussions, looking at how different actors are um, increasingly playing big roles in terms of creating access to electricity um, in different parts of, of Africa, especially, and other parts of the global south as well. My question is, um, to what extent are these interventions by private actors and, and individuals being taken seriously and being considered in energy policy to drive uh, a much broader access to, to electricity, but also to, to, to kind of direct a certain um, level of transition towards more renewable and more sustainable energy um, sources? Um, so that we can actually use these kind of um, um, uh, independent uh, off-grid systems to, to drive a, a more sustainable um, household uh, energy use, for instance. But how is, uh, are these developments being considered more seriously at a policy level to, to drive the energy transitioning in, in southern okay. cities? Thank you. Oh, great. So... I think uh, we just have some uh, four minutes and uh, I want to give one minute each to our panelists to address uh, Joy's question, but also just adding on mine so that I'll have just the last minute to wrap up. But what are the pillars that we need to actually, uh, you know, sort of push to really help with the uh, enhancement of the renewable agenda in Ghana? So anyone can go first. Yeah, so uh, uh, LED uh, just discussed about uh, uh, the new, uh, the, the off-grid system coming to the rural areas and all those things. They're very good, very important. I've been saying this and uh, I'm also for that. But the point is we need to know how beneficial is it. It shouldn't be the case that a touch light, very useful, is done the solar of great solar system than someone buys. And this is the situation today. This, even a touch light is sometimes more beneficial than that. So uh, these are the things we need to change. We need to know that we need to help each other. It's a win-win win -win situation and then everybody benefit from it. So um, also with the energy commission, everybody have to come together and try so that we, we work out things and see how can we make the whole thing uh, fruitful and beneficial for our people. So we need to change something. So I have only one minute. My, 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 my policy is I believe that for what we've been doing until today, we have to do it different ways. We have to change. We have no guarantee that if we change, things will be better. But if things get to be better, trust me, we must change. We must do it different ways. So this is the point. I, my, my belief is what we are doing today is not on the right path. And then uh, we are for this, what you said, we are for that, but we should really know how beneficial is it for the people. Thank you. Yeah, in my case, well, with the upgrade, now we are embarking on this mini grid and there's in other um, uh, communities. That's, uh, for example, for now, as part of the, the universal education policy to include the mini grids and all that. The challenge has been who should drive it? Is it the public sector or the private sector? Right. For some people, particularly the ministry and others, they feel the public sector. But some of us, to me, some of us, it should be a mix. With my experience involved in this, uh, uh, solar energy education activities right from since the 1989 and all those things. When, like um, the, the previous lady said, usually when the private sector is undertaking it, the beneficiaries they are prepared to accept for that for whatever, whatever the price is going to say, so long as they see the benefit. But immediately the government comes in there, they see elements of Ghana participation, then politics comes in. And that's the challenge we have over here. So if politics comes into it, why are you charging me X plus Y amount for you, your service? Why is, why is those in the urban areas are uh, being charged less? And that is the challenge because Ghana here, electrification or electricity, energy provision is politics, excuse me, whether we like it or not. Yeah. So otherwise, 
Sofiano, I agree with you that the, everything is not only caused by other issues. But okay. most cases, that's why we have great all done. But here, uh, cost, affordability is key, and then others follow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sando. Um, Dorothy, do you have any quick? Yeah, so my, my quick add on would be that um, yes, in, in order to move from where we are to get to where we want to be or to advance, yes, we all need to go hand in hand, private sector, public sector together to, to, to make that move. Um, um, in terms of driving it, in terms of developing, in terms of putting the money in, it would have to come from the private sector, and government knows that. So if government is bent on creating the right environment and standing by it and being the regulator, I think it was right. But what we see happening now is you have the environment being created and at the same time, the, that same environment is not working as it's supposed to work. So it ends up being the obstacle to the, to the, to the main goal of developing or advancing in that space. So if clarity is, is, is put to play and each individual playing their roles as they're supposed to. We know who is handling this. We know who owns this. We know who manages this, who regulates this. It becomes clearer for anybody coming in. And I think it gives a fair playing field to the participants and to, to advance to advance their cause. Yes, we need to think um, and think again about how we do things. It's not just going about what has been done somewhere or what has worked somewhere. But how does this fit into our system? How do we get that win-win situation where we are not stifling government or we are not stifling the, distribut the distribution utility or we are not stifling the public sector? How do we do this? We have to do it together and we can only work together. It can't be done by one, it can't be done one by, by one side and it shouldn't be led by just one side only. So I think it's a joint effort that we have to put to play here. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, thank you, Sofiano. Thank you, Dr. Sando. Ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, this topic we needed probably about an hour to address that. Nevertheless, uh, they've touched on some of the key issues that we need to actually take away. There are some positives, even though we are not, we have a figure that is still ranging between 1% and 2% uh, achievement of our you know energy policy target uh is still something that is giving us hope however we can all actually attest to the fact that we still have a lot of hurdles to clear what have i taken away i see us saying that in the collaboration is very key we need a win-win situation and above all that we can never succeed if we do the things that we did yesterday, the same way today, and if we want to do them tomorrow, meaning we need a transformative approach. Uh, on that note, I want to thank the panelists and thank all the participants for um, this wonderful session that we've all actually been part of. The next session, I think, is supposed to start in two minutes' time. Uh, I don't know whether is going to be the case or we are going to have some five minutes break i think we all deserve a break and um um yes prof uh i'm not real. what do we what do you suggest yes hello yes exactly exactly Yes, yes. So we'll have a five minute break. And when we come back, uh, we will have, um, you know, Paul, Rasmus, and Nabole, uh, then Duran actually taking over. In fact, Duran is chairing. Thank you very much to you all. No that. So if government is bent on creating the right environment and standing by it and being the regulator, I think it was right. But what we see happening now is you have the environment being created and at the same time, the, that same environment is not working as it's supposed to work. So it ends up being the obstacle to the, to the, to the main goal of development. What is the CO2?
afforestation, then let's embark on all these afforestation where minimize the whole thing. Because there's nothing like 100% clean. You always going to have challenges with whatever technology you have. Renewables include renewables. Because now we're talking about some countries are talking about 100% renewables, particularly solar and all the education by uh, 2050 and others. Now I keep saying, hey, you're talking about the, what about the batteries, the lithium? that but the point is we need to know how beneficial is it it shouldn't be the case that a touch light very useful is then the solar of great solar system that someone buys and this is the situation today this even a touch light is sometimes more beneficial than that so uh, these are the things we need to change we need to know that we need to help each other. It's win-win it's win -win situation. We have to come together and try so that we, we work out things and see how can we make the whole thing uh, fruitful and beneficial for our people. So we need to change something. So I have only one minute. My, 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 my policy is I believe that for what we've been doing until today, we have to do it different ways. We have to change. We have no guarantee that if we change, Things will be better. But well, if well, things well, get... whatever the price, excuse me, say, so long as they see the benefit. But immediately the government comes in there, they see elements of Ghana participation, then politics comes in. And that's the challenge we have over here. So if politics comes in there, why are you charging me X plus Y amount for you, your service? Why is, why is those in the urban areas uh, being charged less? And that is the challenge because Ghana here. Education or electricity, energy provision. In, in order to move from where we are to get to where we want to be or to advance, yes, we all need to go hand in hand, private sector, public sector together to, to, to make that move yes. to advance their cause. Yes, we need to think um, and think again about how we do things. It's not just going about what has been done somewhere or what has worked somewhere. But how does this fit into our system? How do we get that win-win situation where we are not stifling government or we are not stifling the, distribu the distribution utility or we are not stifling the public sector? How do we do this? We have to do it together and we can only work together. It can't be done by one. Actually take away. There are some positives, even though we are not, we have a figure that is still ranging between 1% and 2% uh, achievement of our you know energy policy target uh is still something that is giving us hope however we can all actually I think we needed probably about an hour to address that nevertheless uh they've touched on some of the key issues that we need to actually take away there are some positives even though we are not we have a figure that is still ranging between one percent and two percent uh, achievement of our you know energy policy target uh is still something that is giving us hope however we can all actually attest to the fact that